Um, today we're going to start by talking about the Internet of Things and the network environment. And I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes just explaining what we mean by the Internet of Things. Um, the Internet of Things is a term that's been floating around for a while. And in a way it's a lovely poetic term, but it's also quite, it's also an ambiguous one. In some ways I think it should, would be better called the Internet in Things because it describes perhaps a world where the internet has been embedded in a collection of physical objects that are in the, in the real world. I think we're all familiar with the, of course we're all familiar with the idea of the internet, the, the fixed line internet that's been around for almost 20 years now. The internet that is screen based, that belongs to desktop computers and is connected by cables um, through the telecommunications network. But the last decade or so, we've also got used to the idea of an untethered internet, an internet that is available on mobile phones or um, through Wi-Fi networks that connect our computers to the internet without that fixed line. But I think what we're going to see over the next few years is a third internet. And this is an internet that is not just unte untethered, but embedded in the physical world around us. When people say to me, what do you mean by that? I say, imagine that the internet is now going to reach beyond the screen. It's no longer going to be just screen based. It's going to be part of our physical world, part of our homes and our offices, factories, and indeed our towns and cities. Um, when you tell this to people, they say, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean that the internet is going to become embedded in the world around us? And I just then describe the number of applications that the internet is going to have that it doesn't really currently have. Everything from our domestic white goods, the electric, electrical goods that are going to be in our homes, someday soon we'll have the capacity to be on the internet, to be either controlled um, remotely on the internet or to record data. <laughs> and I mean almost any electrical good that is currently in the home, our fridges, our microwaves, almost any kind of white goods that you can imagine, might someday have the capacity to be on the internet. All sorts of household appliances um, also will have this capacity. Um, and it's not just going to be expensive goods. Some people think even very small objects in our homes might have IP addresses. Even perhaps our light for things uh, um, could have their own um, individual IP address. Um, our offices also, um, factories, already some um, um, very high-end factories are now controlling components of their machines by giving them IP addresses. Um, and it extends even beyond that. I mean, some people think maybe even parts of our bodies or s certain people might have parts of their, their bodies that might be online. There are already a number of um, healthcare applications, so-called telemedicine, that have been developed that might give, for example, a heart rate monitor or blood pressure monitors, uh, um, uh, um, an IP address, the capacity for them to be um, record, to record data on the internet. Uh, there might be um, 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 athletes, for example, might wear a kit that records uh, their bodily uh, um, data over time um, on the internet. Even in Japan, very expensive, very. Uh, <coughs> expensive livestock already have been embedded with chips that have been given IP addresses, for example. If you want to think about um, how many of these things, when I say the internet in things, how many, of these th how many of these things in the world might be online, I want you to think about barcodes and how many barcodes in the, there are already in the world. And already in the supply chain ma management, many companies are foregoing the barcode and replacing them with um, things like RFID chips, I mean radio frequency identification <coughs> chips that allow uh, companies to monitor their supply chain management all around the world to a much greater extent than they do already. I've seen figures that say there are already billions of these chips in the world. And um, um, the EU, for example, think that these chips will increase 300-fold in the next few years. 
So we're, get, we're seeing a big shift away from, from the barcode towards RFID. Um, if you don't know what an RFID chip is, um, 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 think about if you ever visit London and you use one of the Oyster cards. These, these are already embedded with these kinds of chips. This allows um, London, uh, Transport for London to monitor movements around the city. Um, public transport is a good example actually. In London, most of the buses in London have, have, are effectively <laughs> online. Um, they have chips inside them, they have computers inside them that allow um, the traffic controllers to monitor the buses moving around the city. And so we're already seeing some very big things like buses um, um, forming part of the Internet of Things. And I think over the next few years, smaller and smaller and smaller objects will, will, will become part of that. So I want us to think today, and perhaps you, we, um, when we have the debate <coughs> later, what it means to have physical objects as part of the internet, not just um, if you think about the explosion of websites and how much information there is in the screen-based internet, try and think what it means for society when objects are also part of that internet too. In a moment, I'm going to have to hand you over to Rob Van Kranenberg. I think he's going to talk about what happens to society when these chips and these other technologies come part of the world. Those people who know a little bit about the Internet of Things will know also that it's a little bit of a catch-all term. There are several competing technologies that will form the part of this Internet of Things. I think eventually, in one day, one, one day they will settle down. There won't be so many competing technologies. And to be honest, we don't know which ones yet will succeed. All we know that there is this drive towards it, this drive to extend the internet beyond the screen and into the world around us. Naturally, a lot of people are interested in this. And, and one group that is really driving the internet of things, or, or keenly interested in the in, internet of things, are architects. And we're lucky enough to have two architects on the panel today. After Robert spoke, I'm going to introduce you to Usman Hack, who, who will tell you about a, a, a very exciting project called Patch Bay. Um, when people ask me about the Internet of Things, although some of them shudder and some of them um, are quite fearful, one of the first questions they ask me is why? Why would people put physical objects online. And I think Usman's going to be able to tell you about why he thinks people are putting things online, because as part of Patch Bay, which is a, a network, a peer-to-peer -peer network, where people are already putting physical objects online. He will perhaps be able to explain the motivation. Um, things that are online and part of Patch Bay include things like electricity meters. He has a weather station in the Antarctic, which is floating on an iceberg which is sending data back to the internet. Um, he has a, a, a wind technology center, and this morning he said even a US prison was actually um, uh, um, um, forming part of this network. After Osman has spoken, we're going to um, speak to Ho um, Holger Schnedelbach, who's also an architect here in Nottingham at the Mixed Reality Lab. And I think he's going to talk about how the network environment will affect the built form. But before we go into that, I'm going to hand you over to Rob Van Cranenberg. Well, thanks, Rob. And um, <coughs> of course, thanks to Radio for, um, for having me. And I'm very happy to be here. Because I think, um, well, it's easy to say we're at a crossroads, or, but and, and I like to say it. But I think it's true. And, um, so maybe it's just me uh, growing up, um, but I think we're growing up. If we talk about the internet as most people know it, the World Wide Web, it's only been around for like 15, 16 years. So the first browser mosaic was 1993, Christmas 1993, and now 2009. So basically like 15, 16 years. So the internet as most people know it, uh, as World Wide Web, um, is basically in its teens. So it is indeed sort of growing up. And um, 